Good job, Brittany. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shanae Norman. I'm with Bon Secours. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this year's um, Injury and Prevention Clinic for the YMCA 10K training teams and participants. Um, like I said, welcome on behalf of Bon Secours. Um, we have an array of clinicians and experts on deck to provide you with a lot of great information on how to prepare for race day, how to perform well during the race, as well as how to recover um, after the race. And if you needed to seek any type of um, medical care or treatment, hopefully not. Um, hopefully everyone does great, there's no injuries and you guys may not need us, but either way, we can provide you with some great information on how to prepare and perform well for the race. Um, at the end of each presentation, uh, we'll open it up for questions. So feel free to ask questions. If you have um, something to ask one of our experts, feel free to place it in the chat as well. If you'd like, we'll keep a close eye on the chat and try to get your questions answered. Um, but I know that Everyone is going to have a lot of great information to share. Um, and I encourage us to be just interactive and, um, you know, don't feel, don't be afraid to speak up. If you have a question, um, if you have something that you're currently de dealing with that we can help with, um, just let us know. Um, so um, for the sake of time so that we start the presentations on time and end on time. Um, if no one has anything else that they need, want to say, um, Brittany, I'll give you a chance to say, or Lauren, if either one of you want to say anything on behalf of sports backers before we start, um, that's totally up to you guys. Um, otherwise, our first presenter will be um, Diane Dunn. I'll let each presenter um, introduce themselves. Um, you guys should have the capability to share your screens and your presentations. Um, and just let me know if I can help and facilitate along the way. I will, Brittany, I will say just welcome everyone. Um, thank you for jumping on here. Like Shanae said, hopefully we can give you a lot of great information and answer any questions that you might have specifically about your training or any issues you're running into currently. Um, for all of our Bonsacore folk that are on and presenting. If you guys don't mind dropping your contact information into the chat as well, so people could um, pull from that as needed and, and reach out with, with questions specifically afterwards if they did have them as well. But yeah, Diane, go for it. All right, thank you. Let me see if I can get this pulled up. All right, can everyone see that? Okay. All right, my name is Diane Dunn. I'm a physical therapist with Bon Secours at the training center. I've been um, a physical therapist in the Richmond area for 15 years working with runners. Um, I'm an avid runner myself. I train more uh, marathon distance, but kind of, you know, anything um, and below that. I, you know, enjoy kind of staying healthy, um, being up to date on running, you know, specific injuries and love treating runners. Um, so for any specific questions, you know, feel free to reach out. Kind of today, what we're going to be talking about, you know, is more of the physical therapy perspective um, and preparing for race day, right? Focusing on injury prevention and how you can, you can really um, have some tools in your toolbox in order to maximize your success, you know, for, you know, your race day. So we'll be talking about a little bit about like the foundation of a healthy season, right? So there's different components of trying to prepare your body um, and yourself, you know, to maximize, you know, your success, you know, through the, through the season. So talking a little bit about kind of the extrinsic factors, some shoes, some running attire, um, going into your running training plan, but also including, you know, your proper warm up um, and strength training, and then also talking a little bit about some flexibility and how we, how we target that and when do we target that. 
um, and giving you some specifics that maybe you can adopt um, into your training program as well. And then you kind of understanding some resources that are gonna be available for you. Um, we have different types of you know, services available that can aid into your success as a runner. And knowing that you know, we're here for you um, whenever needed is definitely um, is a plus. And then also when to kind of reach out for you know, some help also can you know, help guide you, you know, in that um, area. So some, some ways that we're gonna talk is kind of like the slow motion video gait analysis that we perform at the clinic, um, utilizing massage therapy and, both, and physical therapy kind of along the way and when to, when to reach out to those services. Um, so I'm gonna talk very briefly because I know we have um, you know, Fleet Feet you know, on here as well, but I'm gonna kind of spin this more in your preparation and equipment kind of into injury prevention and what I look for as a physical therapist. Um, you know, if you were to come into my clinic, the very first thing that I would look at is your shoes, what type of shoes you're wearing, and then how you function in those shoes. Uh, I would say, you know, as a runner, we have very minimal equipment that we need. Um, so making sure that you maximize kind of the, you know, your effectiveness and, and the fit of the shoe. Um, you know, I recommend being fitted and, and buying locally in order to make sure that you have, you know, what, what works for you and you can chat with experts to, to get you, you know, what you need and on the road. So, you know, as, as it kind of appeals to more injury prevention, you know, definitely not all, not all feet are the same, not all, you know, runners kind of, you know, impact the ground the same or take off. Um, and shoe wear can be definitely, you know, important piece of, piece of that. Um, and just as important as shoes themselves, they're simple things such as socks, right? So we all talk about, you know, um, you know, having different pieces of the puzzle um, that make it a whole, but, you know, our shoes and our socks, our socks can um, definitely impact the fit of the shoe, but also can, you know, if we don't have the correct, you know, fit of the sock or the wrong sock, it can also lead to different um, things such as blisters or, you know, friction injuries that can create different mechanics, um, which kind of pulling back and looking at, you know, the, um, from a physical therapy perspective. So um, keeping you healthy and on the road can definitely impact, you know, your clothing as well. So just kind of briefly, you know, not only socks, but just making sure that you have proper fit of your clothing um, and then making sure that you kind of take it for a test run, right? So we're not, you know, trying new things on race day, which can be, you know, pretty, pretty important as we uh, progress into our training program. Um, I, mean, I did mention kind of different, you know, types of uh, our clothing can lead to uh, different types of friction or chafing, you know, in, in runners. And that's, you know, that's a real problem, but being, uh, being able to kind of find your resources that can help to prevent that um, is, you know, they're out there. So different products like Body Glide or some different lubricants um, that, can, that can actually help you, you know, be successful. So it's going to happen. It's just trying to prepare your body and trying to, to know, you know, how to, how to kind of, you know, hit it on the forefront um, and, and being prepared. So um, something to just keep in mind there. Um, so as we kind of talk into some running uh, preparation, kind of, you know, we're going to start with a training program. That's kind of why you signed up for, you know, a training team. So they have kind of an outline of, of your, you know, running program, your running specific program, which is, you know, a, I mean, huge start, right? We all have to have goals and have to have kind of that outlined. But in addition to like our running training program, it's super important to keep our body healthy, um, making sure that we add a little strength training in there and some active warm up, and then talking a little bit about, you know, how we can maintain our mobility and flexibility um, in order to, you know, keep our body safe and also, you know, on the road. So we'll talk a little bit about each one of these in a little bit more detail here. Um, you know, we do have a strength and conditioning coach, Philip, that's going to be talking a little bit more about, you know, strength training, but I just wanted to briefly hit, um, you know, from my view and from physical therapy and, you know, my evaluation of, you know, hundreds of runners over the years that, you know, it definitely is super important to put training, strength training into your, into your program here. Um, understanding that running is not strength training. We need to prepare our legs for race day. We need to prepare our legs for, you know, making sure that, you know, they are strong and nice and stable to withstand what we're, what we're putting them through. So with runners, hip strengthening and core stabilization is a huge, huge part of that. And I would highly recommend kind of adopting some program, you know, and making sure that, you know, we stay nice and strong, you know, throughout. 
Um, but, you know, implementing streak program, you know, two to three times a week, you know, especially in addition to your running, um, if you can, and then definitely consult, you know, coaches, and they'll go into a little bit more about that proper progression of strength training there. But um, our next slide here, I just kind of, you know, briefly discussed um, some exercises, and these are more um, band resisted exercises, things that you would kind of, uh, you know, see a lot in, you know, physical therapy as therapeutic exercises, but target some of the smaller stabilizing muscles um, that are super important in the health of our hips and, um, and through, you know, with running. So things such as your mini band walks, so sidestepping, some zigzags, change of direction kind of with those mini bands can really be effective um, with keeping those muscles kind of turned on and engaged as we start to progress our, you know, running volume. Um, Sideline clams, as shown in the picture, and on, on the right there, works on some of those deeper hip rotators that help to stabilize the pelvis as we, you know, run. Um, running's in a pure kind of sagittal plane exercise, so keeping those muscles kind of in the frontal plane or the side-to-side -side motion nice and strong is super, super important in order to stay, you know, stable. Um, and so some of the other exercises listed there, kind of some, you know, and you can see some of those pictures on there. We won't go into great detail, but um, just as a reference back, as you look back, uh, those are some of the ones that I recommend kind of keeping, keeping you strong. So um, definitely some hip, you know, glutes some quad, and then of course your core stabilization, which is so important there. And then kind of diving into, you know, how we prepare our body. So that's kind of, you know, with the strength training, we're going to, um, we're going to schedule it into our, our weekly schedule, but then this kind of pre-run, right. We're going to go out for a run in the morning. Um, you know, it's nice and, you know, cold 20, 25 degrees. We need to have our body make sure that we have an active warm up. Um, we can't just step on the road and expect our body to, you know, kick in and perform as it, you know, with tight muscles and, you know, getting it to, to go, you know, without preparing it to do so. So um, it's highly recommended that we, you know, perform or more of an active type warm up um, that helps to awaken our nervous system. It takes our body through the range of motion um, that we're about to put it through in order to get it prepared for the running gait cycle. So different active range of motion exercises for runners, um, things such as leg swings, uh, walking lunges, you know, high knees, butt kicks, um, some skips, and you know, some you know, hip rotation and calf stretching can also um, can definitely play a big role in just getting our getting our body ready for you know all of that. If you have any questions about any of that, I'm definitely um, available to kind of give you some examples or show you that too. Um, and then the, you could foam roll or use the stick lightly if needed. I'm not a huge stickler of just kind of really, you know, getting in there deeply before run, but if you need to, you know, take like your stick and kind of just do some gentle rolling just to get the muscles warmed up, um, that's definitely something that, you know, you can do prior to your run. And then, you know, stretching, um, it is not, so if we do our little active, if we do our active warm up, we do some walking lunges, leg swings, we kind of get our, you know, um, do some of our skips and I start to feel, you know, from the day before my calf is a little tight. It's not, you know, it's okay that you, you know, stretch something if you do feel that it does need a little extra attention that day. So just kind of listening to your body, feeling it out, and then also, you know, just using your resources, you know, as needed there is, is good. Um, and then talking a little bit more kind of about the flexibility. So, um, so we prepare our body for, for a, a training run or for a run by doing an active warm up. We do our we do our run, and then afterwards, when our body's nice and warm, that's really when the when we want to get the most out of um, our mobility. So we want to try to do more of our static stretching or really stretch our muscles kind of after our exercise um, to maximize kind of our gains of um, our you know our flexibility there. So studies have shown kind of holding this stretch or static stretch for about 30 seconds, um, repeating it two to three reps. So kind of trying to get around a minute of a stretch in each of your muscle groups afterwards um, is definitely recommended in order to uh, maintain good mobility. I would say the most that I see kind of with runners is, you know, a lot of calf tightness, um, a lot of hip tightness, ITB, um, IT 
your iliotibial band, um, and then you know your hamstrings as well. So there's definitely certain certain uh, available ranges that you need to maximize you know your efficiency with the gait pattern. Um, things that we evaluate in the clinic, and that is it's definitely imperative that we kind of add that extra range of motion and flexibility um, attention after we sh after we run. So here's a slide of just some extra or some stretches that I recommend um, adding in maybe after you stretch. So we, you know, your hip, your hamstring stretch with with a strap. Um, you could also kind of cross that over the body, you know, more to pay attention to your IT band. Um, some quad stretching, your calf stretching, um, uh, your hip flexor, and then also your your piriformis or your 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 deeper glute muscle that needs to be you know, stretched out in order to, to um, minimize your injury there. Um, and then kind of in addition to just your static stretching, we have some self-mobilization tools. Um, and these have become a little bit more, you know, readily available or kind of, you know, adopted, you know, by runners as well. So we have self-mobilization tools such as the foam roll, you have your stick, and then um, you have some other mobilization or uh, ball mobilizations that you can use. Those can be used, you know, after, you know, some of those flexibility things, just trying to roll or knead out, decreasing kind of that lactic acid, you know, buildup in the muscles, improving the mobility of that muscle tissue, um, especially if you feel something is tight or very restricted. Uh, take one of those tools and use it as a self-mobilization. You, you know, don't let it build up over time. Really try to stay on top of any type of tightness, and that can really help to, to um, keep you on that keep you on the road. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's become a kind of increase in popularity is like the Theragun. Um, so things such as the Theragun, you know, I, I think that there's a time and a place for it, some of the larger muscle groups for sure. Um, just be careful, you know, that we're not self-mobilizing over any type of, you know, really bony, you know, areas and that we're keeping it more into like the muscular structures. Um, so kind of talking a little bit more in detail about some of the resources available to maximize some healthy running. Um, we'll dive into video gate analysis in a second, but let me talk, you know, just keeping it in mind that, you know, physical therapy is, is there, you know, as needed, right? So, um, you know, physical therapy is used usually um, utilized after an injury or when you have pain, you know, in a certain area. It's really kind of designed in order to get you back to maximum function, return you, you know, to running and trying to do so kind of to keep, keep you healthy. Um, you know, with the physical therapy evaluation and examination, we really try to kind of um, take you through looking at range of motion, strength, um, your joint mobility in order to determine what the driving factor of your pain is, right? So coming in for, with foot pain, it's not only the foot that, you know, we necessarily look at and treat, kind of try to decide on why this foot pain even started, right? So is there something that we're doing or landing or is it something with our shoe or how we're kind of, you know, uh, approaching, you know, the, the uh, strike that's causing some of this dis discomfort. Um, and then just kind of uh, understanding that, you know, again, we're here for you. We do have direct access available. Um, that means that you, you are able to, you know, call and utilize physical therapy, you know, directly um, without a prescription at this time. Um, and that's done, you know, as, you know, if you're feeling kind of sore or pain in a certain area, um, we have the ability to evaluate and then also refer to physicians as needed and as, um, as warranted there too. Um, and then, you know, utilizing massage therapy, um, I, I do it myself. I mean, in my training schedule, in my kind of, you know, my marathon training schedule, I have my massage therapy sessions scheduled in there just to make sure I maintain a kind of a healthy body. Um, you know, we put our bodies through a lot. We try to, you know, expect a lot out of them and we have to take care of them. We have to make sure that we keep, you know, uh, utilize kind of what we have and what we know in order to stay, you know, on the road. Um, and then, you know, kind of going back to that slow motion video gait analysis, I want to talk a little bit further about that because that's something that, you know, a lot of people don't, don't know is available. Um, it's utilized not only for, you know, people uh, or experiencing injury, runners experiencing injuries, but it's also utilized as injury prevention as well. So I can put you on a, you know, a video. I could use software to slow you down and help to identify different ways that, you know, we can improve your gait pattern. Um, sometimes that, you know, it, 
it's something as, as little as kind of improving, you know, how many steps per minute you are using a metronome in order to, to, um, to get you to speed up in order to decrease some of the stress and uh, forces, joint reaction forces that, you know, we have on our body. Um, sometimes it can tell us, you know, if we're, we're landing a certain way or if we need to add something to our shoe um, or if we need, you know, to, to change or work on a little bit more strengthening in a certain area. So it can really be beneficial in helping to understand the load and the stresses that we put on our body. And if you think about how often we do kind of land on, you know, single leg in a running gait cycle, um, it can be very impactful um, to, to know, you know, what that, what those forces you know, look like, you know, over time. So uh, this next one, this next slide just shows you just two clips, uh, very kind of brief, just understanding of, you know, how I can take some measurements of somebody, you know, landing and, you know, how it impacts the stress of their body. So in the top kind of left, um, you see that taking a measurement of, this is kind of max pronation um, in mid stance. So how much load is on the, on the medial aspect of this person's, um, you know, shin when she's pushing off, this, this individual has a lot of medial tibial stress or kind of shin splints on the inside of her leg. Um, and it, you can see how, you know, how she falls and then also how she, you know, her foot does not, you know, properly uh, resupinate in order to push off. So she's using a lot of those muscles kind of on the inside of her leg in order to push off. And that can tell me a lot about, you know, what's going on and why her pain is occurring as well. Um, the bottom, you know, slide also shows kind of, we look at the knee flexion angle as we land, right? So if we're thinking about, you know, running as kind of landing on single limb repetitively, um, you know, we hope to want to do it as best we can, or, you know, minimize the stress that's on our body. So if we land with a little bit of a, more of a straight knee kind of average, or what we're looking for is about 25 degrees of knee flexion. Um, if anything less than that, that can, that can, you know, increase knee, knee uh, joint pain. It could also increase, you know, how much the hamstring has to work to pull you forward too. So um, different, you know, things that we can look at, you know, in your gait cycle that can help to, you know, keep you healthy and to, to add to what we, what we do. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it. I just wanted to give you like a, uh, a good little summary of how you can utilize just, you know, certain tools um, in the community and kind of learn how you can, you know, keep your body healthy, you know, out on, on the road and, you know, trying to, you know, definitely look at, you know, your shoes, you're running the tire, def you know, your nutrition um, that Abby will talk to you about in a minute um, is also super important. And then working on, you know, your proper active warm up will work on your flexibility afterwards. Um, utilize your, your soft tissue mobilization techniques, your self mobilization techniques. Um, talk to me about any kind of, you know, want or need for video gait analysis. Um, and then, you know, we're here, you know, in PT, if you need, need anything or, um, down the road. So, and that's kind of about it. Do you have any questions, concerns? Uh, Diane, I see in the chat that uh, Lisa DeGroot has a question about calf stretching. Uh, Lisa, do you want to come off mute and ask Diane uh, your question? Sure, thank you. Um, this is uh, my first 10K and this is all great information. So thank you. Um, so for, um, so far, I've been feeling pretty good um, after my runs, and the only thing is uh, my one of my calves is a little tight. Mm -hmm. So I know you mentioned, um, or and there was a picture of the calf, the uh, static calf stretching after the run, but I think what the slide mentioned, um, yeah, like I, I've been doing the one where the man's pushing against the wall. I've been doing that after the run. Mm -hmm. but, and before the run, I thought the slide, the um, I can't remember what you call the, that kind of stretching before your run. Oh, the um, active stretching. Active stretching. Mm -hmm. So um, you, it says the calf, like what can I, can I do something or what can I do to stretch my calf in an active way before I run? Or right. can I do yeah. So, I mean, I, I definitely, if you feel like your calf is tight, um, something that I do, you know, is I take my uh, foot and kind of put my, my toe up on a tire. Right, so I usually I run outside. Um, this is hard to see, but yeah, it's similar to like uh, 
um, little incline wedge that I have. You can imagine like your heel kind of on the ground with your, your toe up on, you know, a tire or a curb. Um, that's something good that you can work on, you know, prior to. You may not hold it like the full 30 seconds, but just kind of get it to, you know, stretch out. Um, you know, you, especially if you're feeling that tightness. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the, the dogs. Anyone else? All right, I think that's it. We will um, move on to Abby, um, and then we'll have a little time at the end, hopefully, that in case anybody else thinks of any other questions that they didn't ask, we can do that at the end. But um, at this time, we'll turn things over to Abby. Thanks. All right, Diane, if you can click not stop sharing, I'll put up mine. All right, can everybody see that still? Hopefully it's not sharing the presenter side. Is it all good, Shanae? You're on mute. Uh, it's it's showing the presenter slide. Ah, <laughs> I <figured. laughs> Thank you. Hang on one second. I'll get it right. There we go. Okay. So, hello everybody. My name is Abby, and I am the sports dietitian with Bon Secours. Um, it's very nice to meet you. And those who have been to one of our talks before um, may recognize me. My name is Abby Foreman Lewis. So, if you've seen me as Abby Foreman or Abby Lewis all the same person. Um, so when we're talking about what we're gonna eat for best, um, best 10K runs, it, first thing we have to do is figure out what are we even talking about running for, right? Is this our first 10K? Are we a veteran runner? Are we aiming for a PR? Are we looking for weight loss? Where are our goals in this? Because that is all going to add to what we decide to eat and how we decide to fuel our run we're all gonna be working towards our best day of performance, but the training process might be a little bit different. So things to consider, are you currently following a particular diet or do you have some health concerns that we need to pay attention to like blood pressure issues or diabetes or prediabetes? All that's gonna add into it as well. And then what do you normally eat or drink? And then what about when you're running? Do you normally eat or drink? That all plays in as far as comfort and stomach comfort and what normally works well for you because nutrition really is personal and what works for you might not be the same as what works for somebody else. So a normal day is actually going to be more important than any one race day or any one day before a race. Even if you have the best options to eat on race day and you're like, I've got every gel in my back pocket. I've tried them all out. I know which ones I like. If you're not eating great every other day while you're training, we're really not maximizing our outcomes for nutrition. Your normal days matter so much more in fueling your body and preparing yourself. So I want you, every time it says race day or every time it says, you know, um, 10 K day, I want you to think back to every single training run you've been having from here on out. Those are your most important runs because they are all practice for the real thing. So first off, take stock of your normal diet now. Is there room for improvement? And if so, where? Because now is your chance to practice those changes and get those into being habits, just like you're practicing your running and just like you're practicing your run technique and uh, paying attention to your shoes and all of those things that Diane just told us to do. What does a normal day look like? What are we aiming for? Well, this is the USOC's athletes plate. So the US Olympic Committee took the my plate that we might've seen as far as what used to be the food pyramid and turned it into a plate. 
And then they made three of them based on our intensity of activity. So this is the off day. So I like to use this as a base plate because it actually looks very much like our my plate. It's got a half of our plate being fruits and vegetables, our produce. It's got a quarter of our plate being our lean protein, which is gonna be great for muscle building, keeping us full um, and building, building bone structure. And then whole grains and starchy vegetables taking up the other quarter of the plate. And then based on whether or not we might have some weight maintenance goals or whatnot, that portion of the plate might shift a little bit. And we'll talk about why in a second. We see that we're using healthy fats as our main source of, health, of fats when we're cooking, things like olive oil, avocado, nuts, and seeds, those unsaturated fat sources. We're choosing water as our first choice beverage, but we might also do some dairy that would give us some calcium or dairy alternatives that would be calcium fortified and going down the list of flavored beverages. And the last one would be those flavored ones that we might choose. Then we're seeing, you know, seasonings as being playing a role on the plate. And all of this together is the most colorful thing you've ever seen because the colors actually show us the vitamins and minerals. So we want a variety of colors, produce, whole grains and starchy vegetables and lean protein each time we're eating. So this is our base plate. Now, when we're talking about training, right? That's an extra activity. That is going to take on a different form of our plate. Can everybody see what might have changed in that plate, right? To go back real quick. And now we've doubled the portion for our hard training day of those starchy vegetables and grains. And the reason is because those are our fantastic sources of carbohydrate. And we'll talk about carbohydrate in a minute. But what didn't change about this plate? Well, that protein, that protein section is still the lean protein options being our first choices, not our only choices, but our main ones. So things like chicken without the skin, lean cuts of beef and lamb and pork, fish, especially fatty fish like high omega-3 fatty acid salmon, tuna and mackerel, sardines, eggs, dairy is another great protein source, and even our vegetarian protein sources like soy and tempeh, tofu, legumes, nuts, and seeds, all of those can play a wonderful role in that protein. And then we're still choosing those healthy fats, but our fat source got a little bit bigger. And our vegetables are still there. They're never disappearing, even when we need to make sure that we're eating more of those grains and starchy vegetable sections. Now, the reason they get a little smaller here is they actually get cooked so that they take up less room in our stomach, but we'll say that why in a minute. But we've got a beautiful, colorful plate every time, no matter what we're training for. Now, I mentioned that carbohydrates on that plate are the big thing that changes, and that is because carbohydrates are your gas tank, especially when we're talking about runs that are getting into the 10K um, distance and longer, and the more intensity, the faster speed we're running at, the more carbohydrate we are going to be using as our primary fuel source. Right now, when we're all just sitting here and, and looking at our screens, we're using mostly fat as a fuel source because it's a lower intensity activity, right? But as our heart rate increases, the more mix of carbohydrate to fat goes up a little bit more. So carbohydrates stored in the body um, as glycogen. And if your glycogen stores were completely topped off, you could go for about 90 minutes without needing to put anything back. If you don't top off your tank, it might not last so long. And when people are going for longer runs, especially when you're getting up above that 10K distance, when you're getting into half marathon and marathon training distance and even ultras, we run the risk of running out of fuel, running out of carbohydrates in our muscles as that fuel source. And that's called hitting the wall, if everybody's heard of, of that term or bonking. So the likelihood that we're going to run out of energy, run out of carbohydrates on a 10K is a little lower because of the distance that we're running, the amount of time we're running. But if we're not fueling properly, if we're not going into the event with a fuel tank that is full of those carbohydrate sources, then it is actually possible to have a bunk or to hit the wall on a 10K. Um, so thinking about how we're eating on that 
daily basis to make sure that that fuel source is topped off. So our fuel source, carbohydrates, comes from all those things you see up in that corner. Grains, starchy vegetables, um, beans, fruit, and dairy are our carbohydrate sources. And there's a lot of talk these days about carbohydrates being bad for us. And I would definitely um, step on the brakes on that one big time because it is not that any one food is bad for us, but it's a matter of are we matching the amount that we need for the activity that we're doing? Um, do we need a lot of carbohydrates if we're not going to be very active in the day and mostly sitting at a desk? No, because I'm not using carbohydrates to a big extent right now while sitting here. But we've got two different types of carbohydrates, and especially when we're talking about increasing our activity level, like training for a 10K, we need to think about where those carbohydrates serve their best purpose. Low glycemic carbohydrates or high fiber, whole grains, whole fruits, whole vegetables are gonna be awesome for keeping you full and satisfied at meals. They are going to fill up that carbohydrate gas tank that we call glycogen, and they are fantastic for your meals and farther away from your actual run. Because of that fiber, not gonna sit so well if they're getting too close to that run. The higher glycemic carbohydrates or simpler carbohydrates as they're often called are going to be perfect for if we don't have much time for digestion, right? They're a quick fuel source. No, well, not many people are going to be chomping down on carrots and beans in the middle of a marathon. I have seen it done and don't know how they turned out, but it's not your main source. It's not your best choice. Quick fuel has a purpose and it's great option for when we need fuel during our race or right before or right after. So when we're thinking about getting into that run, the first thing you're going to wake up and think is, I need to drink water. If you don't normally look at your urine in the toilet, at your pee color, take a look now. If it is not the color of old fashioned sticky note or lighter, those manila colored sticky notes or lighter, then we need to get drinking because going into your run or going into your day dehydrated is setting you back a bit. It's harder to play catch up than anything else. So when you're about, um, when you're thinking about how you're gonna do it, we wanna be at least starting in the morning, but at max, at most we wanna wait two to three hours before our run, before our race, when we're starting to drink. And we're gonna drink about 16 ounces of water. That's one of those normal water bottles. If you're running for less than 60 minutes and less than 90 minutes, then water is a great primary choice. If we're going longer than 90 minutes in one of your training runs, or maybe we're training for an event longer than a 10K after this, then a sports beverage might be a good idea, especially if we need to put back things other than water from sweat, like electrolytes, which is sodium, or like if we're not gonna get a chance to eat anything um, and our glycogen store is getting low. So two to three hours beforehand, drink 16 ounces of water. Doesn't mean chug it down, it means sip it over that hour or so. And then 10 to 20 minutes before you run, drink another cup. Now, if this seems like a small amount of water before the run, great, you're used to drinking a little bit more. Remember, you might need to go to the bathroom. Um, during every, uh, every 15, 20 minutes or so, being able to sip on some water is helpful. If you're going for a run, you know, three to six miles, you might not need to drink at that point. But if we're going for longer, um, sipping throughout or even stashing a water bottle somewhere along your run can be beneficial. Remember, Drinking and eating during the race or during the run is gonna be more important if you didn't do much of it beforehand because you're gonna be playing a little bit of catch up. So your stomach can hold about one liter, which is about um, four cups of water per hour. So that's why we don't wanna be chugging too much faster than that because you will be sending yourself to the toilet. Now, after we're putting it all back, right? You sweat it out this water, we wanna get it back so that we're getting to sticky note yellow uh, urine again as soon as possible. Now, don't chug it down then, sip it slowly, um, and you'll absorb it better. When we're talking about fueling before that race, we are talking about carbohydrates, but we need to be thinking about how long that carbohydrate is going to take to digest and what is going to feel okay on my stomach. 
So it's less about, am I getting the perfect amount of carbohydrate and more about how am I feeling with it sitting in my stomach and have I practiced that? So the things that slow down digestion are fiber, fat, and protein, which are fantastic for having at mealtime, just not right before we're going to go run. The things that empty faster from the stomach are liquids versus solids. So if you really have no time, go with a liquid carbohydrate beverage instead of eating something, especially if you have a finicky stomach closer to. And practice, practice, practice. Don't choose something just because everybody else says it's the best fuel for you. Now is your training time. So practice what you're gonna eat for that race day as well and see what does work and what doesn't work for you. See what, how much time you really need to digest it to feel like it's sitting well on your stomach. So I like to think about it as a timeline when we're thinking about when our race is, we're thinking backwards and making sure that we are drinking water throughout. If we've got three to four hours before our race, we can probably handle a full plate of food. We can probably handle that full athlete's plate with things like carbohydrate, protein and fat at that meal. The closer we're going to be getting to that race time, the less fiber, the less fat, the less protein meat white we might want to have. We always want to be having that water. And then during we're focusing mostly on hydration. And if we need it, simple carbohydrates, like something like Gatorade or a chew or a block. Uh, but the during race fueling is really most important only if you missed the one to two hours before or the three to four hours. So if you're able to get those other fueling times in, you probably don't need anything during the race itself. And then afterwards, we're putting it all back. That's especially important for actually after your training runs, when you're going to be doing multiple runs um, each week and really consistently um, expecting your body to perform. So replenishing all of the stores is really preparation for that next activity. If after your long run, you don't have anything going on for a week, recovery is not as much important as far as having a specific recovery plan. It's more that when you eat your next meal, you're going to be recovering over that amount of time. But if you're training right now, we definitely want to be thinking about putting that great meal afterwards with that balanced plate, including all of those um, carbohydrates, protein, and fat right afterwards and getting that fluid intake in. So pre-race, what are you going to be practicing? What could it look like? Well, you're going to have a main source of carbohydrates and the amount of carbohydrates you might need is going to be a little bit dependent on your body weight, anywhere from one to four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight. Usually I like to say, if you've got one hour before, go with one gram per kilogram you got two hours before, go with two grams per kilogram, three hours, three. And most people are not going to be able to get up to three and four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram. It's If it's outside of your normal um, eating pattern, then it's, it's probably going to be somewhere in the lower range. Um, and then because it takes practice to get your stomach used to handling that amount of carbohydrate if it's not used to it either. Choosing lower fiber. And if you really have GI issues, choose liquids keeping that fat and protein lower. Now, not sleeping breakfast is my general recommendation. If you are a wake up at four or 5 a.m. or and not going to eat before that race or that run, well, then that night before meal becomes your pre-race fueling time. That night before becomes the most important one where we wanna make sure that our gas tank is as topped off as we can be. And keep everything similar as what you've eaten before because um, now is your practice and then you're gonna actually use it come race day. So this just shows us when we're talking about during race fueling, the distance and the time amount that we're racing for is gonna dictate how much carbohydrate we need. Generally speaking for the 10K, we're really not gonna be needing much fuel in, the, in that session unless we really didn't get a chance to put any gas in our gas tank, any carbohydrates beforehand. So water is going to be a great source. And for those who are serious competitive runners and are going for their PR um, or going to potentially win the Monument 10K, sometimes actually grabbing, um, grabbing food and beverage on the way is going to take more time out of your run than it is to actually improve your performance. 
So going in, having eaten beforehand and having topped off your tank becomes more important. And for reference, when it does talk about grams of carbohydrate, 15 grams comes in eight ounces of Gatorade to put it into perspective and about 15 grams per slice of bread or 15 grams in a, um, in a half a banana. That recovery, four to six hours afterwards, optimizing it, getting it in. So within 30 minutes, try and have something to build back that muscle. And then with some carbohydrate and some protein, and then within two hours, we're having a little bit bigger of a snack. We can handle a little bit more protein. We can handle a little bit more fat in there too. And then another four to six hours repeating that with your good balanced meal. If your goal is weight loss during this process, your recovery meal should be that next planned meal. So it's nice to time the run, um, your run so that when you're ending, you're hungry and you're ready for that next meal you are already going to have instead of trying to add in extra calories. But if we are looking to maintain weight or even build well, then making sure we're adding those extra calories to make up for the amount we are using during our run. So take stock of what you're currently eating. Your daily nutrition is what matters most. So now is perfect time to be practicing any changes you can to improve your, um, improve your normal daily nutrition. Your carbohydrates are your gas tank. So topping those off, whether it's the night before or right before the run, and then starting at least 24 hours beforehand to get that tank topped off for actual race day. The things that slow down digestion, fat, fiber, and protein, great for mealtime, bad for before runs, and hydration all day, every day, keeping that consistent pattern of before, during, and after, and put back all of the things that you used and prepare for your next great run. All right, any questions? I'm hungry now. <laughs> All right, well, we will go ahead and pass the torch to Philip, I think. Yes, to Philip. All right, are you guys seeing my screen correctly? All right, so I am Phil Gandhi. I'm one of the sports performance coordinators here. I also, I'm not an avid runner currently. I don't run in the cold. So I take winters off because I'm from SoCal and I didn't ever deal with cold. So out here, I don't run in the winters, uh, but I understand running and I have a lot of experience and understand the struggles. Um, so for me as a sports performance coordinator here, we coach and train clients in the gym. Uh, we work on anything from weight loss, strength training, training for sport, speed and agility, anything you can really think of, we sort of customize a plan to you. And a lot of times when we look at people and how they train for sport, this is sort of an idea of what I see people do. They train on their skills for their specific sport. So running, you guys run a lot. And I, we do that because we are focusing on our performance, which for you is nice and easy and not complicated because it's a clock, but I could dive in on that too. And because we want our clock to improve, we look at our training and recovery. And then if we have any sort of issues, we might focus on our movement patterns. And then if we have an injury, we start to worry about our health. The problem with that is this is what our actual training reality is. That very sport specific training is the skills at top, your performance is under, training and recovery, movement, and then that all is built upon our health overall. And so for us at here, everything we do when we train people, we take the whole person into perspective. Like it's no good if I make you able to run a sub seven minute mile, and then two days later, you're just like can't walk because you're so sore and you hurt yourself. And this is why we struggle, because we try to build 
on this little platform and stack all these things in the wrong order. And this is oftentimes where we see injuries come in and we see struggles and issues with trying to figure out why can't I handle this right now? I've done this before. Why am I not getting the times I want? Because we're thinking about this backwards. And then when we go back to this, the way we should be thinking about it, if we stretch that even farther, it looks even more like this. So what we do in the gym is going to be that top part of the pyramid and everything down under there is what you do 24 hours a day, every day, which is why breathing is set at the bottom. And then for me specifically, I study sports psychology in grad school. And so that mindset and how we think about things is going to determine your nutrition is important. And Abby can tell you about how important your relationship to food is in addition to just the food itself. But your training level on a day when you've slept four hours versus a day you've slept eight hours is going to be completely different. Like how he was stressing on that water, how much water you drink that day will completely change what you can do for us in the gym. And so it's so important for us that we take into all this. And then we kind of come in here, right here with this movement patterns, which is where we jump in to completing a warm up. So the complete warm up. I am just as bad as some of you may have been. And I used to say, I'm a runner, I'll warm up on the way. Um, I don't do that anymore, especially because it's cold out here. So I, I can't enjoy the weather like I used to to do that. But the big point of our warm up is we're trying to raise our body's core temperature. We're trying to increase blood flow across the whole body. And we're really trying to prepare the muscles, but also our nervous system for what we're about to do. So that involves not just waking up those big muscles that we use, but doing things like those clamshells and doing our calf stretches and lunging both forward and sideways so that all the muscles that we're using, even the little ones and the ones we use a little less are going to be awake and ready to go. And in addition to that, we can do soft tissue work, which is gonna be your foam rolling, your lacrosse balls, um, static stretching, your mobility work. The big one for me is a dynamic warm up. Uh, Dan already mentioned earlier how the best time to stretch is usually after a workout. And for all my runners that argue they like to stretch before a workout, if you stretch after your last run, you stretch before this run. So the best time to work out stretch is always going to be after your workout. All right. But I will take any stretching over no stretching. So I'll still take that over nothing. Along that same vein, we have our post-workout recovery. This is incredibly important. Again, your post-workout recovery whether it's just a training day or a race day, is going to determine what you can do for your next run. You're only going to be as good as you are recovered from your last run. So the sooner you feel better and the better you feel, the harder we can push. And it's going to really just push up that level of training. So for us, we bring people in and we find out where you're at that very specific day. And we can try to keep a good training log can be important too, because that allows us to see what maybe pushes you over the limit more so than others. And again, post-workout recovery is a lot of the same things that nutrition. I can tell you personally, when I learned more about nutrition, it was amazing how less sore and how much better I felt after I made sure I actually ate good proper food after a run versus days when I didn't. Um, and doing that soft tissue work stretching, I have a go-to sitcom routine, I call it. I put on some dumb show that I've probably seen before, so I don't really have to focus. And I lay on the floor, I foam roll, I stretch. I have a little timer that dings, it tells me to change stretches. I have it as mindless as I can so that I can just make sure I do my stretching. Now, so the big one for me, most common reason for injury, runners are notorious for overuse injuries. And it often gets thrown into the category of overtraining. I personally do not like the use of overtraining from our world with the science. Overtraining means you were doing everything in the world, right? You're sleeping 10 hours a day. You're eating all your nutrients. You're timing them great. You're strength training twice a week. You're doing your runs. You're following your plan. 
and your body can't keep up. The reality, what most ha times happens when we get injured is we're under recovery, which can be having poor to no warm up, in inadequate gear, we're overuse, and really having a poor training plan, which I love that you guys are signed up for a plan. And the big one for me is poor movement patterns. And for us, that's where strength training, I think, plays a big role. It's something I wish I would have known about a lot sooner. I went from training, running, you know, nine times a week to running five times every two weeks, strength training three times a week, and able to maintain about 90% of what I was able to with just running. From having better movement patterns, being able to push that much harder. And so that's where we really want to see you guys jump in in the idea is what we teach you in the gym is to help you move better all day, every day. We can go over different exercises and I can correlate it to each life. A deadlift is just learning how to pick something up. A squat is just learning how to stand up from seated position. And if we can get you in the gym and teach you these positions and these movement patterns and how your body is supposed to move in its proper way, that will stay with you all day, every day. Because we only get you for you only do your workouts, even if you're a very avid exerciser, you're still looking at maybe like five, eight hours a week with everything that you do. And what you do 24 seven, 365 is gonna matter so much more. The way you hold yourself when you're walking, the tightness in your back when you go on a run. I was notorious for always thinking running did everything because I would loosen up on my run. And then as soon as I finished my run, everything would just tighten right back up. And then, so that's where our strength training comes in handy. We can really work to help you overall. And then once we have a nice base of stabilization, endurance, which you probably will already have, we can start working on strength. Another big thing I see from runners when they come into the gym, they will do more endurance training in the gym. You do not need to do 100,000 reps on your legs when you come into the gym, you already do that on the asphalt every single run. So for me, it's important that we are lifting relatively heavy in a safe capacity, trying to increase that overall strength. And like Diane had mentioned before, we do all our training here based off your season, your performance when you're trying to perform. So there's a time and place for everything that we do, which goes back into our cross training. So. That's our weight training. Like I mentioned, our improved movement patterns. The benefits of having these improved movement patterns and having better movement all around is you're gonna reduce your chances of injury. You're gonna make your joints more stable. Oftentimes you'll lead to weight loss with increase in lean muscle mass and you'll see increased flexibility. Runners are great at having flexibility in running and in the forms that it takes, but oftentimes myself included are very tight everywhere else. And that's where doing things in the gym that you wouldn't normally do in a run are amazing. Uh, other great things, um, single modalities, biking, elliptical, swimming can be great, reduces the stress on your joints as we're going through. If you're trying to maintain that still aerobic fitness without necessarily focusing on putting all that weight and pressure on your joints, or if you're like me and you wanna do some sort of aerobic fitness, but not be outside in the cold. Lastly, I wanted to touch in on sports psychology. I know it's getting more and more popular as more and more athletes come out to talk about it. These are some of the general things that working with someone trained in sports psychology, working with a mental performance coach, sports psychologist can offer. And this is quite, a robust list of things. Um, you can read them yourselves. I don't want to talk about all of them, but I did make a list of what I think is important specifically for runners. One of those being in a growth mindset. And with that is always thinking about where we can go, not limiting yourself to a single race. When you're on a run, you can't just be stuck on the pain you feel now or this one workout that feels really awful or is really hard, we're focusing on our training plan as a whole, big picture. Um, creating a mantra can be really good. 
something for me. Uh, it was something my mom gave me. Didn't even know what my mantra was at the time, but it was, I don't get passed on uphills. It was just something, it was a sense of pride, but it was just whenever I was running hills, it was just, I don't get passed on hills. I don't get passed on hills. And it's something I would say to myself again and again, and my focus would go off how my leg burned and it would go to my mantra. Um, with that though, on the flip side, an important thing is working on staying in your lane and keeping focused on you and running your own race. There is honestly, I don't know, I've played many sports and I don't know if there's anything harder than trying not to go out too fast on a big start race. When you have hundreds, if not thousands of people rushing through and your heart is pounding with adrenaline and you're like, I feel great right now. I can push my pace. And then you get to the first mile marker and you're like, I went way too fast. So that is something important, knowing your plan ahead of time, going into it and having a plan to stay in your lane and then learning your own body, knowing when to and having that sort of mind body connection of knowing where you're at. Which for me, this is one I've loved to implement is an in-race checklist. It's a set of rules that you come up with to determine whether you're okay to push the pace. And it can be looking back like, okay, did I hit my split for my last mile? Check. Do my legs feel good right now? Check. Scale one to 10, how hard am I breathing? Seven or below? Check. Okay, I'm allowed to push another five, 10 seconds off pace. And what this can do is really give you something that you came up with beforehand so that you're not playing off your emotions in race. I've done it myself. You're like, I feel great. I think I can do this. But if you skip one of those steps on there, you know what? I feel great in my head, but I'm actually, let me look at my breathing for a second. Wow, I'm actually breathing a lot harder than I realized. Let me wait. Next checkpoint. Okay, you can push off. If you're still feeling good, you hit your checklist now. How's my breath? My breath's actually good now. Then you can push pace. What this can do is really keep us in to a plan and not playing off our emotions. Running is such a mental sport and it's very easy to get over eager or on the flip side, a little demoralized or like, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not sure I can finish all these miles. You can go through that mental checklist, be like, wait, you know what? I'm actually, I hit my pace. My legs feel good. Yeah, my breathing's fine. I can actually pick it up or I'm good to keep maintaining. And the last two, big for me, pre-race routine, sleep routine. Um, just like Abby was talking about with your race day nutrition, it, you, you don't, Diane mentioned it too, you don't change things on race day. You don't wear new shoes on race day. You don't change your nutrition on race day. I made that mistake one time, never ate bananas, ate a banana on race day, saw my banana on mile one. It was a poor idea. I still don't like bananas to this day. It's a little salty for me, not physically, but all right. So having those routines and what we can do is we can tie your emotions and sort of take that feeling and tie it to your routines. When you feel like, oh my gosh, I don't feel ready for this. I don't feel ready for this. You can be like, wait, I did the same thing I do every day. I go out and did my run two days ago and I was fine because I had my pre-race routine. Did I do that today? Yes. I have that performance. I can rely on it. If I was good then, I'll be good now. And then another one for me, sleep, sleep, sleep. If you were running and you were training a lot, I can't emphasize how important sleep is. It is one of our most underutilized recovery hacks that we don't use. And for me personally, that is becoming and creating a sleep routine to get you ready. There's nothing that's gonna help you more on the day before a race than having a good meal and then getting eight to 10 hours of sleep. And if you can eye mask, I sleep eye mask, earplugs, fans on, so that when I wake up in the middle of the night, I was like, did my alarm go off yet? Nope, go back to sleep. Limiting the stimulus, creating that routine beforehand, limiting what we see before we go to bed so that we can really shut everything down and get that sleep and create a habit of doing it so that our brain tells our body when we start doing these things, 
for me, it's when I take my vitamins. I take my vitamins, I brush my teeth, I come in, I read, and my brain knows when I take my vitamins, I'm going to get sleepy. If I take my vitamins early, I'm probably going to bed early because my brain has associated taking my nighttime vitamins with going to bed. And that's something we can utilize that our brain already does in creating habits to really dig in and set up a good routine and sort of hack our brain for that. And there's countless, countless other things we can do from a sports psych's perspective. We can really work on that mind-body connection. We can work on any specific thing you have, confidence, any fears, um, anxiety before race. The list goes on and on, and it really would be athlete-specific. But the possibilities are endless, and that's really all I have for you guys this evening. All right, thanks, Philip. Um, you you muted yourself, Shanae. I must have clicked something. Sorry. Thanks, Brittany. Okay, so next up, um, we have two presenters, co-presenters, um, our primary care sports medicine. Um, fellows that, um, Sam, are you and Rula still going to co-present? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I will hand it over to them. Oh, there you are. I didn't, uh, see, your, I didn't see your face. Hey. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, the floor is yours. I just need the, uh, need to be made co-host again. I had to, my internet cut out at one point, so I had to log back in. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, perfect. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good time learning some stuff. Learned some stuff myself too, which is amazing. Uh, my name is Samuel Jacob. Um, I'm one of the sports medicine fellows and also with us, we have Rula al uh, the other sports medicine fellow. I myself have a background in physical medicine rehabilitation and Rula has a background in family medicine. Uh, so we're just gonna take you through some um, common injuries uh, that we see in runners, uh, both in training and on during marathon or event day, as well as some, some prevention things that we could do in order to prevent those injuries, of course. All right, so before we kind of go through all the injuries and scare you away, of course, everyone knows the benefits of running and exercise as a whole. Um, it can help with weight loss, can help lower cholesterol, helps lower blood pressure, helps increase endurance overall, and it reduces your risk of heart disease, um, reduces your risk of osteoporosis, diabetes, and obesity. Um, it helps decrease with anxiety and depression, and it also helps with improved self-esteem. And lastly, it's, it's easy to, to pick up. It's not much equipment required, just need to make sure that you have some good shoes as we've learned. Um, so some stats, some quick stats, approximately 15% of all Americans are avid runners, and that's over 50 million Americans. Um, however, over the course of one year, there's an injury, injury rate of 27% in novice or beginner runners, 32% uh, in long distance runners, and 52% in marathon runners. Uh, now, novice or beginner runners are injured two times as much as recreational numbers. Uh, as recreational runners. And you might just be confused for a second because you're like, oh wait, only 20, in one year, only 27% of novice runners are getting injured, whereas 52% of marathon runners, that's just based off the actual mileage. Marathon runners are running a lot more, so they tend to get more injuries just based off the number of miles. And women are actually at a lower risk of overall uh, running injuries. Um, uh, and injuries as a whole, about most commonly, we're seeing injuries that are happening from overuse uh, and during training, or it's, it's not from the acute injury itself. It's from the repetitive wear uh, that's occurring. Um, and that could be due to several factors, whether it be improper footwear, 
uh, high mileage or high intensity or a sudden change in our mileage and intensity, uh, inadequate strength in the lower extremities, uh, flat feet, um, discrepancies in leg length, um, height and weight, um, any tightness in the hamstrings and any decrease in bone mineral density. And then of course we, um, less often, but still we see acute injuries that happen. And usually those are ankle sprains or hamstring injuries. Most commonly uh, what's injured is the knee itself. Um, by the way, can everyone see my mouse by the way, or? Okay, perfect. Um, so first off, there's something called patellar tendinopathy. And what that is, is you get tendinopathy of the patellar tendon, and that's what runs right here in front of the knee. Um, typically occurs, um, and you typically feel it when you're doing deep squats, especially, you might get a little bit of pain um, right here in the front of the knee. Um, another pain that we could get is something called patellofemoral pain syndrome, and that is a little bit more nonspecific. You might have generalized pain all throughout the knee, um, usually at the front and usually on the inside aspect of that knee. And that pain uh, might be worse with running. People might notice that they're sitting for prolonged periods of times and then they stand up. Uh, they get the pain more often. It's something that we actually call theater sign. For example, you're sitting in a theater for a long period of time and then you get up and you're like, oh, my knee hurts. You might sometimes feel some cracking in your knee or um, some popping in your knee at times. Um, and uh, it's, it can definitely hurt after um, different forms of activity. And that is involved with stress in the joint itself. Um, it's typically managed and it typically indicates that we have weak cores and a weak glute. So we typically work on that area, both the core and the glute to kind of strengthen those areas to kind of help out the knee. Uh, we could also do some taping to that region to kind of make sure the patella is gliding properly because usually that's the issue that's happening. We tend to see these often more, more often in women and it has to do with the angle of the pelvis when it comes to the knee. Um, as uh, females tend to have just a little bit of a wider pelvis, the knees tend to come in a little bit more. And sometimes females are slightly more affected uh, with patellofemoral syndrome compared to males. Some Another syndrome that we see is something called IT band or iliotibial band syndrome. And that's usually on the outside uh, of our knee. Um, that pain involves the IT band, especially as it comes over the bone of the femur. And sometimes you could even feel like a little bit of snapping as that IT band comes across your knee. Uh, and that pain typically gets worse as we tend to run a little bit more. Sometimes we, not, we might not feel it at the beginning of our run, but as we tend to run along, you're like, oh, wow, my knee really hurts, especially on the outside of the knee. Um, Typically what we do for that is we strengthen the muscles, especially once again, when it comes to the glute as uh, some muscles as, um, in regards to the quads and that typically helps, but it does take a while for those types of symptoms to go away. And then there's degenerative joint disease or arthritic changes. Now it's very important to realize that running itself is not what's causing the arthritis or degenerative changes and it doesn't worsen it in any way, shape or form. However, sometimes due to improper, improper running techniques or due to improper like form or shoes that you might be wearing, it can sometimes exacerbate ex already existing arthritis that's there. And sometimes you might have a little bit of inflammation of that joint or some swelling in that joint. Once again, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get arthritis if you run and you're not gonna worsen your arthritis if you run. So just very important to keep that in mind. And hamstring injuries, typically we're feeling this in the back. You could get both acute hamstring tears or you could get chronic hamstring strains. Typically the acute or the quick onset um, hamstring tears that you get typically are deeper in the buttock. Uh, sometimes you might hear or feel a popping sensation and typically results in a bruise um, that you could that is visualized in the buttock. And sometimes we also get those chronic over time hamstring strains. Those typically can involve the entire uh, length of the hamstring itself. It can come from our knee and shoot all the way up to our buttock or vice versa. Hmm. And then of course, um, ankle sprains, something that's seen very commonly, usually it involves what we, what we refer to as inversion of the ankle or the ankle kind of rolling inside, can sometimes also roll outward. 
Um, you'll see swelling, you'll have pain on the outside of your foot right here. Um, it might be difficult to walk. Typically what we're trying to look for as um, in, from the medical standpoint is how are the ligaments that are keeping your foot stable? How are they doing? We wanna make sure that, is it a sprain or is there a tear of a ligament? The ligaments are what are holding the ankle stable and we're keeping it in position. And we always wanna make sure that that's strong and that there's no tear in it. Sprains typically resolve quicker than tears. Typically when there are tears, it does um, have a longer course of recovery. Another thing that we also wanna make sure is that there's no high ankle sprain or of course that there's no fracture. So typically these we will image once we do get a patient that does have an ankle sprain. Uh, something else that we do see is Achilles tendinopathy or Achilles ruptures. The Achilles um, is a tendon that comes from, it extends from two muscles from the back of our calves, both the gastrox and the soleus, and they form this tendon together and that actually attaches to the base of the, the to the heel itself. Now we can have tendinopathy here and that can lead to a lot of pain that, that stretches the back of our heel itself. Um, typically, when you continue to exercise or you continue, if you ignore it, it can potentially lead to a, a rupture or a complete tear of the Achilles tendon itself. And that happens more commonly in sprinters, especially when you're doing explosive type activities, you can see that it happens uh, more commonly the tear itself. So you wanna make sure that you're managing that and treating that and managing of that um, also sometimes involves uh, resting that area, topical medications to that area. Um, and splints that we might use, and very importantly, some, some eccentric, what we call eccentric exercises to that area. And then uh, plantar fasciitis, um, something that uh, we might have all heard about. It is a thick band that runs underneath our foot itself. Um, typically, you'll feel pain on the inside of your foot, and it might shoot up all the way to your toes. We tend to see it more commonly in patients that might have flat feet. Um, the pain is usually like when you wake up in the morning, you take that first step out of bed and you're like, oh, wow, the bottom of my foot really hurts. Um, especially once again, in patients that have flat feet, or if you're standing for long periods of time, um, once again, what's things that we do for that are conservative stretches, splinting, making sure that we have proper shoes. Now, tibial injuries. Now we might've all heard of something called shin splints. It's also known as medial tibial stress syndrome. And what that typically involves is, uh, like it says, a stress, the beginnings of the stress injury or on our tibia can potentially cause micro fractures as well on the bone. Uh, it usually happens uh, when we are suddenly increasing activity, when we're running on new terrain, um, when we're, there are training errors, we have flat feet, or once again, that increase in mileage, that increase in intensity, that's where when we typically get it. Usually the pain that you get is on the lower aspect of your leg. Um, so not all the way, particularly at the ankle, but before the ankle, and it's usually on the inside of the shins. That's typically where the pain is. And it's not, it's very commonly happens on both sides, not only just on one side. Now, typically how we manage that is with activity modification. Usually we have to cut back a little bit on the mileage or the intensity that we're doing and kind of uh, advance as, as your symptoms tolerate. Now that could potentially progress to something called tibial stress fractures. And what a tibial stress fracture is exactly like it says, it's a fracture that's developed after prolonged periods of stress once again from that sudden increase in mileage or intensity that we might have. Um, that typically has a longer course of recovery. Um, we typically will image them. You don't always see them on imaging. Sometimes you, on sorry, typical x-ray imaging, you, sometimes you might need some special imaging in order to find it. But the difference between that and shin splints is that there's a more prolonged uh, time period that you might be out for that several months actually. So you always wanna make sure that you are managing it earlier and that you have the right shoes. You're not increasing your mileage too quickly. Now exertional compartment syndrome is something that we might see, um, especially in avid runners. Sometimes um, uh, people that are in the military will get them very commonly. And that's when 
you have a lot of tightness in your legs essentially, and that's compressing on your muscles, but it can also compress on your nerves or the blood flow in your legs. So when you have exertional compartment syndrome, you might sometimes have numbness or tingling that goes into your feet and you might have coldness in your feet, especially when you're going on your runs. And that's something that we always wanna watch out for as well. Now, when it comes to skin, some things that we commonly see are blisters or toenail injuries. The blisters itself, we'll commonly see them at the back of the heel. Now, typically what you wanna do with these is you wanna basically leave it as is. You don't wanna interfere with it too much. You don't wanna pop it on your own or anything. You wanna leave it as is, just make sure that the area is clean and dry. Uh, you wanna, you could use some topical antibiotic um, uh, gels that you might have. Uh, put it on the area and cover it with a Band-Aid. Uh, some ways that you could prevent this is just making sure that there's some padding on the back of your heel. If you're someone that develops it, make sure that your shoes and your socks are dry. You can also put some tape over the area, but once again, just leave it. Don't try to pop it on your own. Sometimes if it's big enough, um, we might, um, might drain it easily in the office. Yeah, and then I'll let Dr. Alba, did you go over uh, prevention? Okay, um, so I think we um, had some great presentations about you know preventing injuries with form ups and whatnot. So that is certainly part of it. You definitely um, want to have your muscles warmed up with various stretches and kind of warm up exercises. You also want to ensure the proper footwear, um, and that's going to vary person to person. As long as you're having some supportive footwear. Um, and that typically we advise ones that you've already been training with um, and are used to. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend going out and buying a new pair of shoes right before, you know, a major event or race. Um, and if, you know, any of the shoes are giving you issues like blisters or um, whatnot, then um, probably look into switching them out. Now you also want to, you know, during training, make sure that you're in a good, safe terrain or an environment, um, both to kind of um, prevent an injury, um, uh, being in an unsafe environment, but also having an even kind of surface to run on to prevent the um, like in improper loading of certain joints or stressing certain muscles. You would want to definitely pace yourself. Um, and so working through a program where you're gradually ramping up your, you know, be it your speed or your distance um, and not necessarily going from zero to 100, but rather um, going like by 10, 15% each week. Um, sometimes we find that those who train with others or with groups have, um, you know, uh, less chance of injury uh, because you're following a program together and monitoring each other. Um, but again, you can, as long as you stick to some form of plan where it's gradual increase um, of your activity and endurance, then um, that hopefully should help prevent any injury. And, you know, as Sam talked through the common injuries, you know, while you're running, if you feel that something is very painful um, and it's kind of repeatedly nagging on you, you know, that's a good idea to stop and get evaluated because, you know, having some soreness and aching um, more so after um, a run is, you know, it's to be expected as you are putting more stress onto your muscles and building up that endurance. But if something on a specific location or area um, is becoming more and more painful, then this is probably something that you should evaluate. And when in doubt, it's always good to reach out to a health professional and have something evaluated because you do not want to, um, you know, repeat uh, insult to injury uh, or participate in, a, in an event or a run um, that you shouldn't potentially. Um, and so proper running technique or proper form um, is something that you can pay attention to. Um, so to make sure that your arms are swinging naturally by your sides and you keep your elbows at 90 degrees, um, you'd want to make sure that your head and trunk is upright um, and then you lean your hips slightly forward. You keep your jaw and your shoulders relaxed. You know, sometimes we don't notice that we carry a lot of tension in those areas and you want to 
deep breathe through the nose and out through the mouth. Um, try to take short, quick strides rather than long, slow ones. And you keep your um, stride length short enough so your foot strikes right under your knee rather than in front of it. Um, and then you want to try to land uh, lightly on your feet and allow the knees to bend as your foot hits the ground. You know, we all kind of prefer like heel striking or a mid foot strike, but you want to try and get that um, balance with the heel strike and rolling your foot in um, just to have a little bit of the um, shock absorbed um, throughout. Um, and then right at a pace that lets you talk with someone without getting out of breath. Um, and that's probably how you're going to manage to have that um, good endurance and last through the 10K as opposed to exhausting yourself right in the beginning, kind of running out of fuel towards the end. So any questions? <clears throat> I have a question here. Let me turn my video on. Oops, here we go. Um, it's for Sam and I've done the training team in the past, but I'm just coming back to running from not running for a long time. And I did notice after Saturday's three mile run, um, I told a friend, I've got a pain in my knee that I've never felt before. And sure enough, it was, I think it was the Teleofemoral pain. So I didn't run yesterday and I'm just wondering, I mean, it doesn't hurt like crazy and I can certainly still do squats, but I'm just wondering, should I sort of back off a little bit and see how it goes for the next two runs or any yeah, quick I guess some of the like kind of things that you'd want to look out for and these are usually when there's like an associated you know, fall or injury, you always want to make sure is there's no what we call mechanical symptoms. And that's what it's like, you feel like your knee is like locking up or your knee is like giving out on you. Those are kind of like some, some of the signs are like, hey, I need a, or if they're sorry, swelling, those are some of the signs that, hey, I need to get evaluated a little bit sooner. Now, when it comes to like the patellofemoral symptoms or some of the other uh, syndrome or some of the other things that we talked about, there's, you're not, it's going to hurt. <laughs> um, it's going to hurt doing these things, especially when you're doing them in right form, you're predisposed to injuring other areas. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is, you know, just kind of make sure you get evaluated by someone, you know, just make sure that there's some, there's nothing else going on. And especially when it comes to patellofemoral syndrome, it's something that's very common. There are some things that we could do to help improve that. And once again, it comes from the core and it comes from, you know, it, it also comes, it comes from the foot and it comes from the core, it comes from the buttock, not just the knee itself. Okay. So there's multiple areas that we could fix. So I, I don't want to tell you to run on it and then continue to, you know, run through your pain. I would definitely right. use pain as your guiding kind of factor. It's okay to have a little bit of relative rest, see how things go. And then don't basically don't run through your pain. Use okay. your body as your guide and your pain as your guide. And then of course, you know, if this is something that's not getting better or something that's getting worse, then definitely come in for evaluation to one of your doctors or us. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to IT band issues. So it was really <laughs> weird to have something on the other side of my knee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The IT band can be tricky to kind of go. <laughs> I think I'm through that one though. So <laughs> thank you. No problem. All right, are there any other questions? Does anybody have any questions for any of the presenters? And then I'm gonna let Brittany do her thing and then we'll wrap up. I think we had a question in the chat for Abby um, uh, about what some examples were of foods that were not fibrous, fatty, or protein rich. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about decreasing fat, fiber, and protein, we're talking about taking whatever your normal meal was and just swapping from whole grain versions to white grain versions. So it might be white bread on a sandwich instead of whole grain and decreasing the amount of protein that might've been on something like a sandwich. So um, if you'd normally put a couple of slices of meat on there, decreasing to maybe just one, and then um, including 
decreasing the fat. So if you're taking that sandwich example, cutting back on mayo. So something that somebody might have before a run might be like a banana and an English muffin with a light spread of peanut butter is probably the most popular um, one, or it could be something like a granola bar or even, um, even like a bowl of cereal if you can handle a little bit of milk beforehand. Again, lower fiber, lower protein, lower fat, the closer you get. So if you're further out, you can handle a little more. And if you really can't tolerate anything because you're practicing all these, then go with liquids. So if you're having stomach upset, then go with something as simple as a Gatorade. And I, I'll jump in real quick. Um, so our good friend, Jeff Wells over at Fleet Feet was gonna be a part of this this evening, um, but they are absolutely slammed at the store. So he texted me that he's he's super busy helping customers um, right now and unfortunately couldn't make it. But I will kind of just give them a plug. Fleet Feet is our partner. Um, for the Ucraps Monument Avenue 10K, they have locations or they have a location at Shore Pump and in West Hampton. And they are just like a really great resource for um, all your like shoe and gear needs. Uh, I think just about every one of our presenters mentioned having proper footwear um, and shoes that weren't too worn out and are appropriately fitted to your foot. And they are excellent for that. Um, they also have the things like the foam rollers and the sticks and massage guns and whatever else you may need in, in all of your training efforts. So if you're looking for anything or have questions specific to gear, I know that they are there and more than happy to help you and assist you find everything you need. And gear up is Monday, right? So I believe you're right. Let me double check on my calendar. Yes, so Monday is the next gear up day um, at Fleet Feet. So that's 10% off your purchases um, at either location. And then we'll have another one towards the end of March as well at Fleet Feet. But again, thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you to all of our awesome presenters for such amazing information. Yes, a lot of great information. Um, on behalf of Bon Secours, thank you guys for attending. Um, hopefully you were able to get some great information, get your questions asked. Um, if you find that you have any additional questions after this, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you want to be seen by one of our experts or clinicians, um, let us know. We can help you get, help get that set up. Um, if no one else has anything, um, I'm good on my end. And um, again, thank you guys for coming. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Brittany. Bye, Brittany. Thank you. Thank See you. Us.